Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of the Fat Games Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Blair. I am Gary. On this episode, we are focusing purely on indie game music, and our guest is this awesome, renowned musician, and definitely our most handsome guest we've ever had on the podcast, Zach Zinger. How are you doing, Zach? The word, the word is notorious, not renowned. But ah, okay. I appreciate, we'll the, I appreciate the positive info or uh, intro. We'll go with notorious, but I'll, we, we can stick with renowned as well. So Zach Zinger is a real cool name. Is that your real name? Yeah, you'd be surprised how often I actually get this question. Um, it's, it's, it's more frequent than, than I would think. But yeah, it's, that's my name. Uh, my parents had a, uh, have, have a pretty good sense of humor. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they must have known you were going to be an artist. Yeah, this this story goes from them that I was born very quickly, and so they I needed a name befitting of the way I came into the world. So Zach Zinger ended up being <laughs> it. Uh, so I narrowly avoided Travis. Sorry to all the Travises out there. It's a fine name. <laughs> Zach Zinger is a great name. Yeah. So let's right, so uh, let's. Uh, oh, sorry, to interrupt. You, no, go ahead, Gary. I was gonna say let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background, Zach. Uh, so you have actually a very strong interest in Japanese music and musical instruments and uh, apparently you've spent a lot of time in japan uh you want to talk about that a little bit yeah sure um well my uh wife uh girlfriend for 10 years and now recently wife is japanese um and so she was my introduction to japan in the first place i'd always like played japanese games um and in fact final fantasy 10 was the one that made me decide i kind of wanted to get into game music um but in going over to Japan a few times, uh, I started to meet people with my, with an interest of ga in game music. Uh, met a friend of a friend who was looking for someone to do um, some Monster Hunter uh, things with Capcom, like a big band rearrangement. So that's how I started to get into that world. And then in visiting there on business and visiting uh, friends uh, over time, uh, I, I eventually found the Shakuhachi, uh, which is a Japanese bamboo flute. That one right here uh so it's coming it's, up it's, through the uh, virtual background yeah there. sorry for anyone who's just listening uh, it's a five hold uh piece of madake bamboo uh with a notch in the in the top of it um and i saw an, an american playing uh jazz uh with a big band on it uh when i went to see a show um with the tokyo big band and i just thought it was really cool uh, that you could like get in between notes um so uh unlike a regular flute so that's that kind of got me interested in japanese traditional music and i've been studying it ever since gary knows how to play one of those right gary no i do remember in uh i think about like grade three that we all learned how to use uh or play recorders uh-huh <laughs> yeah well and all i remember is like other other kids like uh showing me how much like gross spit was in uh was in those things when we opened them at the end Oh yeah, yeah. Those so you are, definitely need to, need to run a rag through them every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not not a recorder. Funny enough, recorder is a fipple flute because you blow into a mouthpiece. But this is just a, a flute because you blow over an edge, um, which gives you a lot more control over the expressiveness of the sound. So, did you actually get that uh, in Japan? Yeah, um, I, I, there's a maker there who makes all of my shakuhachis. Um, this one's kind of unusual because I play modern music rather than, I mean, I do play some traditional music and it's good for that, but it's not a traditional, uh, the, the holes are much bigger. If I had another like traditional shakuhachi run, I could show you, but the uh, holes are much bigger. The way this is cut is very different. Uh, it flares out at the, at the end, kind of like a trumpet. Uh, that gives it Zach, a can you speak bigger. into the microphone a little oh, bit more? From uh, yeah, I forgot I'm on a dynamic mic here. Um, but yeah, it, it flares out at the at the end, which is a much more uh, a, a much bigger sound, uh, brighter sound because of that, and the bigger holes let you play chromatic music more easily. Um, so yeah, I got this one in Japan, Japan, uh, with the intention to play in modern music with it, and I, I love their model. So I, all my all the shakuhachis I play are by them. So did you actually say that was custom made? for you or? um th this one wasn't um this one uh, is this was the one that i bought uh the guy who uh, introduced me to the shakuhachi at that big band concert brought me over there um and i could barely make a sound on this at first but he just told me this is a good one you should get this so i trusted him and i'm glad i did um but since then i've developed a relationship with the guys over there and i've helped them design uh, an aluminum shakuhachi 
um, that's uh, it, it's it's the same thing, but uh, but made of aluminum. I don't. Yeah, I have one of those out right now too. I was practicing earlier, <laughs> so there's just a bunch of shakalajis on my bed. Um, so this is an aluminum one. It's, it's a larger size, but uh, you can see you can like move the holes around on it to make it really comfortable for your hands. Um, oh, wow! So I was testing these out uh, for the last couple of years to to help them arrive at a design, um, and this is the one they came up with. The only instrument I ever learned how to play was the clarinet with the intention of playing the saxophone. However, I quit before I got mm. the sax saxophone because I was in sixth grade and um, guess I wasn't too disciplined back then to stick with things. You know, uh, I wish I had started on clarinet and then switched to saxophone. Instead, I played saxophone first and then eventually had to learn clarinet. It's way easier going the way you were going to do it. Hmm. So That's not what I was late. told. Not but, too late. Uh, well... <laughs> Probably uh, it's not on not, not not on the radar right now. I, I prefer making games instead of making the music for them. Yeah, well, that takes some dedication too. <laughs> Probably oh my god, a lot yeah. more. Blair, I had no idea that you wanted to play saxophone. Oh yeah, you did. We talked about this, this the, uh, before for sure. It's a revelation. Uh, all right. Well, a conversation for another time then. Exactly. One where we can actually drink. <laughs> you mentioned Final Fantasy X. Not to disparage that game or Square Enix. I really didn't like it, though. Oh, <laughs> but yeah? it had great music. Oh. What I'll did you like about it? I actually really liked Final Fantasy X. Oh. Really? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I have opinions about this. I did not like that everything was on rails. I did not like the story. Like To me, it was, I was when I played about for about 10 hours, and I was always on the fence of whether or not I was going to keep going. And then I think there was that one uh, cut scene where that meme where they're like on that like cliff or whatever and they start laughing and it sounds ridiculous. That's and that's I'm like, okay, I think I'm done. I'm good. No, and... those, are, those are valid criticisms. Um, it is on rails, but for me, it was the first Final Fantasy, first JRPG I really ever played. Ah. Um, and so it, it, there was just a lot new there. Um, so if, like if I'd played like seven or eight or nine before that, I might have a different opinion, but the first one's always the best one, you know? Some nostalgia uh, there then. Uh, yeah, definitely. And just like, especially when you get to the end of that one, there's some musical moments that are just, the way they used uh, motifs and themes throughout the the entire game, not just like, here's, here's this theme for this town, here's this theme for this thing, th this theme for that, and you never hear it again. Like you would hear, for instance, the Hymn of the Faith in various forms throughout the story to help tell that story and i thought like that's what movies do i had never thought you could do that with a game and so it just kind of got things churning that's pretty cool um and on that note your triple a work is pretty extensive street fighter 5 final <laughs> fantasy 15 just cause 4 super smash brothers ultimate you know no one's heard of these games so you know <laughs> whatever but uh like that, those are incredible titles uh it's gotta be I, i'm kind of like gushing a little bit that we actually have you on the podcast and you've worked on all these kind of really awesome games. What was it like making those? Well, music uh, those? you know, each one's uh, a little different. You know, when you do things, because I'm a composer and performer, uh, when you do, uh, and I play quite a few different instruments. So when you do different things, you get to be involved in pr a lot more projects for a lot of different reasons. So for instance, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, I didn't compose for that game um, yet. But I did, uh, I did play Kena on it um, for one of the tracks within the game, um, which was a chance I got to work with uh, Yoko Shimomura uh, wow. for. She had arranged a track from uh, Final Fantasy VII, uh, Cosmo Canyon. Um, oh, really? So yeah, that was her arrangement. Uh, so I got to work with her and just, you know, if you told like 10-year-old me, uh, you're going to get to work with Yoko Shimomura in any capacity, I would have I would have flipped out, you know? Have you ever worked with Yuzo Koshiro? No, I have not. That would be so awesome. He, he did yeah. some awesome music for Streets of Rage, where he gets bare knuckle, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, especially in the on from those '90s, like the golden era. Like, there are some legendary composers, especially in Japan, that are just you know they're still around and they're still composing, and it's and it, it's it's wild like to to see. It's probably I th I would think it's kind of how like athletes feel who are just coming into the NFL now, and they're like that's actually tom brady like I, I grew up watching him on tv and now here he is 
like burning me. So you're working, you, you get to work with your heroes effectively. Yeah. A any it's like a, uh, disappointments in, in the really there or is it all been good? I, disappointments? Yeah. Um, I'd say maybe the bit, of, not any specific disappointment about any person or anything, but it's the big, biggest disappointment about AAA games in general is that it's big money games, right? So they don't want, uh, generally, they're not looking to take a risk, uh, a creative risk. So when it comes to the music, oftentimes it'll be, here's a reference track from some Hollywood picture that sold really well at the box office. It's like, in their minds, you know, it's it's coming from the top. It's not the music team that's thinking this, but the people, uh, the executives are are saying we need to recoup the millions of dollars, which is understandable. Yeah. Uh, so we don't want to take a risk. We want just safe music that, uh, and so that happens occasionally. Most often, if if it's orchestra, I get the Avengers soundtrack, and most often, if it's jazz, I think every jazz video game soundtrack I've ever been asked to do, they send me Cowboy Bebop as a reference. So when Gary was writing the opening music for Kids of Carindale, I said, I, I, my instructions to him was, make it like the Avengers. <laughs> he did not. Yeah. So the, I mean, the great thing about the Avengers, like that, that main theme in the Avengers is great. It's very it is heroic. Great. It's but very hard to live up to when you're trying to write <laughs> heroic music. The great thing about Gary, though, is he always ignores me when I tell him to do something. He does what he wants, which actually mm. works out in our, to our benefit as well. Hmm. I think that's the uh, that's my advantage is uh, I can do whatever I want, and uh, <laughs> I I, I, t I can take some risks, which yeah. I have plans for. So yeah, th I mean that's the fun part about indie games is you get to be involved in a much earlier time, and uh, where where the music hasn't been necessarily set in a direction where they're not used to temp tracks or they might not even know what they want and they're just like you're the music expert you take it, and that's when it gets really fun creatively. So indies where all the fun's at. So what are some of the indie titles you've worked on? Yeah, so I, I actually had to pull up my my credit list to, to look at them because I haven't really worked on that many. Like once you're in the, they're kind of separate uh, separate networks, you know? Like if you're working in the AAA space, you're not necessarily building many connections with people in the indie space and vice versa. So it's kind of hard to cross over from one to the other. Um, but, you know, being in New York uh, with... Um, uh, with playcrafting uh, around here, it's it's a great resource to have, or it has been in the past uh, for meeting people in the indie space. So, um, with that in mind, the take was um, was probably the the biggest indie game that I worked on. It's a VR game for Vive um, by Studio Studios. Um, it's basically a big hide and seek thing, but they were looking for a jazz soundtrack like spy music. Um, and that was just a really fun one to write and uh, and integrate. And they they had some general ideas, cowboy cowboy bebop among them, of uh, what they wanted <laughs> for the jazz soundtrack. But we ended up going with this kind of Austin Powers direction for one of the characters, and then just like a really uh, like uh, kind of uh, writing as if I was Thelonious Monk um, for Big Band um, for the other character who was supposed to be sort of a. Uh, sort of i mean his character sounded like monk the way they described it to me so that was a really fun one to work on and i got to bring that to the table sweet so when how often do you go back and play the games and listen to all your music is it kind of like <laughs> actors listening to their watching them perform or, or listening to themselves on a podcast afterwards like oh i can't listen to what i produced or whatever yeah i mean it's um so like for the take i don't have a vibe so i don't get to play that one um but for some of the some of the other games like Street Fighter, actually, I'm really bad at Street Fighter. Um, I I haven't taken the time to learn like all the combinations and stuff. So through pure button mashing, I've been able to see some of my some of my music. But like there are some stages that I can't get to because <laughs> I'm just too bad. So I just have to YouTube those ones. You have to uh, hang out with Gary and I sometime. We will have death matches with Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat 2 or 3. Mm. Uh, usually he kicks my ass, but I give him a pretty good fight. Uh, and, you know, he maybe learned something. But it was also right. in the 16-bit era, so uh, it's, uh, it's not Street, Street Fighter 5. I have um, I don't know how much crossover there is these days, but... Yeah, I've only played Street buttons, Fighter. Huh? Yeah. Sorry, See, it's uh, all, all about having a rival. And Larry is my oh, Mortal it Kombat. Drives you to practice more? Exactly. Mm. Well, we used to do a lot more when we were kids and lived in the same city. It's a little harder now. 
Mm-hmm. We still, uh, whenever we get together, we still play pool together, and that rivalry is basically unchanged for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, usually uh, the shooting gets really bad after a couple whiskeys. So. <laughs> That's when I get good, and he gets bad. So you know, things turn around. <laughs> oh, we should uh, we should tell Zach the story later about when uh, when I came down to New York and we played pool, and then the uh, I think uh, I asked for a glass of uh, bourbon, and then they just they free poured it. And they filled up the whole glass, and then uh, that completely <laughs> messed me up for the rest of the night. Wow, Gary's not used to that in the U.S. Because in Canada, it's really hard for bars to get away with that because uh, oh. the liquor laws are so strict. Mm. So uh, he got himself shit faced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Up in Canada here, Zach, they uh, they're they're very strict about like how much alcohol they're allowed to pour, so they have to do it by like by the millimeter, right? Wow. Like they have to measure everything like out in the shot glass. Yeah. Wow. Have you ever been to Japan? I've uh, been in Japan twice. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you've had sake poured for you where they like overflow it. So it goes into the box. Yes. Uh, under, yes. In, yeah, the, in the wooden box. Like complete yeah. opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was at an all you can drink sake bar uh, uh, one night when I was there with some coworkers. That so next day a survival was... story then. Yeah. And then, uh, then. I ordered soju by the end of the night and I really couldn't taste whatever I was drinking at that point. Cause I was already pretty drunk. Like then we went the to another Korean bar. Thing? Soju. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's next. That's next. I feel like that's even stronger than shochu. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we, I didn't finish it. Everyone stopped me from finishing it. So they, some, some friends. people there weren't as drunk as me. And then we went to another bar and that's when I learned you were actually allowed to smoke indoors in Tokyo because it's kind of like backwards because they want to keep their streets clean. <laughs> so that was, um, oh, I'd never thought that was why, but that makes perfect sense. So that was, yeah, uh, that's I think, a uh, sorry to interrupt, but, uh, on, on that note, Blair, I think the smokiest place I ever went to in Tokyo was the KFC. <laughs> Hilarious. I did not go to KFC while I was there. No, like I, I went in because I wanted to go grab some quick and it was close, right? And I went in there and like the, the main end men, uh, the main item on the menu was hot dogs and there was like a bunch of people in there smoking as if it was like a billiard hall. That is hilarious. Yeah, uh, I, I try to avoid those places as much as I can, but uh, yeah, sometimes you walk in. I mean, you see like in the airport, the smoke rooms, right? Yeah, I didn't go in those, but yeah. I remember seeing them. Yeah, that seems like a that seems like lung disease waiting to happen. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Um, so we've talked about what you've done. Uh, now let's talk about uh, how you do it. Uh, what is your process like, Zach? All right. Yeah, that's 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 what I like talking about. Um, so process. Uh, I mean, what do you mean? Like how? Like working with a client or working on the music or? Um, I guess let's talk first about, uh, how, how you work on the music. Sure. Um, generally, um, unless there's a special request or the client wants to do it a different way, um, I'll get the, the brief, which is either a reference track or directions. Um, I try to get them to give me just, if it's, if there's no reference track, I try to get them to give me, uh, like five adjectives to describe non-musical adjectives to describe how they want the player to feel in whatever situation. Um, so whether that's a story game where they want the player to feel sad or happy or something because of a story element, or whether that's a fighting game where, uh, they just need them to need the player to feel excited. Um, uh, I try to get five adjectives, non-musical, uh, for them to describe because they're not musicians. It's not their job to think in a musical way. I don't want them to tell, to say, uh, we need this to be swing music. I want them to say it needs to feel frantic and then I might make that decision to make it swing uh, as a way to emotionally represent that. Um, So that's kind of how I view the job as a composer, Um, just sort of the the audio emotion emotion control uh, for any given situation. Um, If they have interactive things they want to do with it, that obviously you need to know that up front and you got to figure out a plan for how you're going to integrate that um, and how you're going to compose that. Um, and then as far as like what I'm using, what I'm using to actually make the music, I use digital performer, uh, shout out to all the, to the DP user out there or the three of you who may be listening, uh, Gary, you ever use DP, uh, digital performer? No, um, I'm, I'm guessing that's your, I guess your software that you use. Yeah, like, that's the DLW. Uh, you haven't even heard of it. 
Oh man. <laughs> yeah. I, I've heard of it. I, I can't remember it, but I used, I, I remember thinking, thinking that was more like a, um, uh, like a, a suite to, for like, um, I guess expressing your MIDI notes in like, kind of like, like standard musical notation. Mm. Oh, I, I might be thinking about stylus though. So. Oh yeah, no, it's not that. Yeah. The, uh, quick scribe option in DP is just as bad as it is in uh, logic or pro tools or anything else. Okay. Um, but no, it was, it was one of the OG DAWs, uh, in the nineties, it was just called performer, um, and film scoring, uh, composers loved it. Um, and it's still really, really good for film scoring. Um, but that's what they were teaching at Berkeley, uh, when I went there and that's the first DAW I worked in. And it's the one I've worked in ever since. And that's just uh, what I feel comfortable working in now. Noob uh, question. What's a DAW? Oh, sorry for the uninitiated, uh, a digital audio workstation. Ah. So if you ever open up GarageBand on your computer, that's a digital audio workstation. Got it. Uh, I've used that once. Didn't, I just opened it. That was about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I myself, like I use, uh, I use Ableton these days, mm -hmm. uh, but like the, the first, um, I guess kind of media based software that I, that I played with was uh, Cakewalk. Mm -hmm. And it was because it came with, um, this this computer that I that that uh, me and my family bought back in the day, and uh, I actually stuck with Cakewalk for quite a quite a long time, I guess, yeah. until they, just recently I switched over to Ableton. Oh, they so they still make Cakewalk? Yeah, they do. Um, I think this, uh, this Singaporean company called Bandland bought it, so it's actually available for free now. Okay, nice. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot out there now. Uh, I know, like a lot of game composers are really high on Reaper these days. I hear that that word going around a lot. At, at yeah, or, I at think least. the 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 big one for Reaper is that it's cheap and supposedly it fits on a disc. Hmm. You need like those old school floppy disks that uh, that were around when me and Blair were first learning computers. Like you only had like less than two megs back when we we're using Impulse Tracker. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't really see why that's beneficial to have it fit on a floppy disk. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's, um, so I can plug the, floppy I, don't, I don't know if that's the like trade more, but I remember kind of, it was a lightweight, um, yeah. Okay. Software, yeah. So. I mean, cool. If it, if, as long as it can do the things, that's the thing. Like there are all these different programs out there, but they all pretty much do the same things. Like Ableton is better at doing live stuff than a lot of things. DP just up to upgraded to or up just upgrade updated to version eleven now, and I haven't downloaded that yet. But supposedly they're trying to com uh, compete with Ableton now um, with the live stuff. So that's I mean, they, but they all do the same things. They all record things. They all give you the ch the uh, the tools to automate MIDI. It's just a different set of hotkeys and a different interface, really. So whatever you like using, um, it all works. Yeah, the, the way I understand it is like, yeah, they all do the same thing, but like the workflow is different mm -hmm. a little bit for, for each, right? So yeah, I, I think sure. um, yeah. the, the way I like to record stuff, um, yeah, I really like Ableton. So that's why, that's why I switched yeah. over. Find what, find what works for you. Like Logic messes me up because all of the, like the instrument, MIDI and audio tracks will all be rolled into one. Uh, so, but in DP, you get to, you like, you have to set it all up. So you have to have the MIDI track, uh, routed and then route it manually to an instrument track and route that manually to an audio track. If you're not just using the instrument output, uh, output from the instruments. So like your, tr your sessions end up huge, but you have so many different ways you can bust things. It's, uh, it feels weird to me not to be not, not to see all of that there. So logic, every time I've tried to work in there, I'm kind of freaking out. Like, where's all my, where are all my tracks? So to each his own, that's what it comes down to is it's, it's it, whatever helps you make the music and realize the vision that you, that you have is the most important thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Okay. Um, so are, when you're composing, are there certain instruments that you like to center compositions around or, um, is, is a lot of it, uh, I guess relating to reference tracks that I guess your, your client, um, kind of gives you. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question i guess it it kind of varies project to project but my like when it's like okay time to sit down and start composing um yeah i'll usually throw on uh, unless it's like a specific like a specifically very rhythmic track I'll, I'll usually throw on the piano 
just a, a neutral piano sound because that's as neutral a sound as I can, as my ears can muster, unless I just had a keyboard full of sine waves. Uh, but that's kind of where I, I come up with my melodic ideas. Um, or I'll think conceptually um, outside of that. So for instance, um, you know, if just in a very simple literal example, if there's a scene where a character is falling, the concept might be, okay, we're gonna have the melody like fall also. You know, that would be a very natural thing to do to score that scene or to score that, uh, whatever that, even if it's like a, say it's like a parachuting thing in a game, like you're, you're parachuting, but you're descending towards earth. The general contour of the melodies then I might decide to have descending. So that's what, uh, that's, I feel like a way you can make your compositions more, um, more like they have to be that way rather than this is just a random decision I made in the moment, you know, if, if that, if that makes sense, it's dramatically scoring it, representing something musically, uh, in a, representing a concept musically. And that kind of gives unity to the whole scene in my, in my experience. Yeah. Cause there's, there's kind of like a, like a parallel concept of the same thing that's happening at the same time, right? Like you're mm -hmm. falling, but also, you know, there's, sounds in the background that are kind of pure falling if it's if either like melodically or even just by pitch yeah and there's they're happening million, they're happening too at the same time yeah and there's a million ways you can represent f like that falling sensation you could also decide to focus more on the fact that you're accelerating and maybe the tempo is picking up or maybe the uh the subdivisions of the that, that you're focusing on are speeding up i mean there's a million creative ways you can represent it and that's where your taste and your experience and your, your, you're the filter uh, to figure out what those ideas uh, are going to end up looking like or sounding like. Um, but looking from a conceptual point of view, especially when you're banging your head, like it's so rare to just have divine inspiration. Ah, the melody, it comes. And you, you can't really get that on demand, uh, unfortunately. I wish I could every time. But when it's not there, which is 99% of the time, um, you got to start thinking outside of the box and so, or put yourself in a box um, to, to try to come up with ideas that you might not other have otherwise have just thought of musically. Very interesting. Um, I want to pivot back to a client question. Do sure. any of your clients has come back, come to you and just like, I wanted to sound like beep, boop, bop and beep, beep, beep. <laughs> just make some weird noises to you and you're just like if not you got to work with me <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mean like sing something like literally sing, sing something, something or like like try to make some instrumental noises or some shit like that or <laughs> um you know for video games i don't think so because generally especially with triple a by the time it gets to me like they've already pretty much decided like here's here's the reference track or it's going through a, they have an audio a whole audio team and there's an audio director okay. who's at least a little bit musically literate um so if they if it comes to actual musical feedback um usually the only time it gets to getting actual musical feedback is it, if we're on like revision 20 and the, like they just keep on changing their mind and i just have to be like okay we're done talking about creative de decisions now like you obviously have something very specific in mind so tell me what that is uh, and then i'll just get the musical feedback and then i mean those are the least satisfying ones because then you just you're just pushing something out it doesn't feel like it comes from you it's not your baby anymore um and so then you just kind of feel like a vessel that's things are getting run through um but no i i have had one really funny one in like shortly after i graduated from from school uh there was this guy uh, I won't say his name, but he, there was this guy who would like, he'd just like get high on shrooms and pound on a keyboard and record all of it, like record the MIDI of all of it. And then he'd bring it to me. This guy's like 70 years old and he'd bring it to me and he'd, he'd be like, orchestrate this, turn it into a full orchestra. And he was it was like kind of how I made money like when I first graduated from school because this guy had the money to record it with a full orchestra. So it was it was a money gig and a really interesting one from the standpoint of dealing with a client. Was it good? Because 
You know, it's not as bad as you'd think it would have been. It wasn't like Gorilla Fists. It was like he had figured out that if you skip, if you press one key on the keyboard and then skip one and go to another one and then skip one and go to another one, it kind of makes a nice sounding thing. I don't think he knew to call it a chord. <laughs> but, um, the, the one that this is probably the, 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 the most frustrating feedback I've ever gotten is that he was and he sounded like an old um, like like uh, like a 1920s gangster like that. Yeah, see. Like he sounded exactly like that. It was hilarious. But he he was telling me um, he wanted uh, more electronics in the things I was sending him. And I, I was looking at it as a musical challenge, like take this thing that's not quite musical and make it musical, like reharmonize it, arrange it in a certain way. But he just kept on coming back. I did so many revisions. He's like, it needs more electronics. Where are the electronics? I asked for electronics. And I'm like, I, I, what do you mean electronic? It's an orchestra. What do you even mean by that? Uh, and I tried a million different things. And eventually I figured out he meant reverb. He wanted <laughs> reverb. Reverb. More reverb. Yeah. He wanted to sell like a Super Nintendo game. Uh, he just. No, wanted- just like more, more space. Yeah uh to to sound like it was in a bigger hall yeah so electronics equals reverb uh that so yeah when i found that out i was okay okay that's we're (laughs) we're in for it here that's a hilarious story yeah is that guy Uh, still around i think so i don't know i haven't i that was like 10 years ago so i haven't heard anything about him um but he also insisted that i um use his tempo because I was trying to so we were going to record with an orchestra. So I thought like, you know, we should probably get a click track that'll make this line up so we can all play it together. And he was adamant, like, no, you have to capture the moment of inspiration. So you have to follow my tempo. So my click track ended up sounding like, it was just all over the place. And I remember coming into this orchestra and they played back the click for them and they all just stopped and laughed and everybody in the cold control room looked at me and I was just like, but, but the client, the clients. So, you know, sometimes you have to kind of like say like, okay, (laughs) okay. Yeah. We hear you and then do what you know is best or else a situation like that might arise. But those are the lessons you learn, you know? That is the uh, the rhythm of the mushrooms doing its job. The rhythm of the what? The rhythm of the mushrooms doing their job. He could see the sound while he was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so Zach, you being a uh, fan of video games, would you ever want to make your own video game, or at least kind of be a, a big part of um, being the principal composer of, let's say, a particular project? Yeah, obviously. Um, I mean, to the second question, definitely. Yes. Um, you know, many of the, most of the projects I've worked on with Japan, um, are, uh, and in AAA are, uh, they have their own in-house composing team. That's kind of the way they do it in Japan is they have, um, in-house like salaried composers who just compose all day for Capcom or Square Enix or whoever it might be, Bandai Namco. Um, but, Every once in a while, they'll either be looking outside that skill set, which is how I got involved in this in the first place. They were looking for somebody who could do jazz, um, or they want to, for whatever reason, they have they want to look for a foreign composer, uh, or just a composer that's not um, not within their company. So I usually get involved at that level, um, which is where there's still other people composing a lot of the tracks, um, and then I'm composing the ones that are suited to my style. Um, for something like jump, that's what happened with like street fighter. Um, but for something like jump force, um, that was all independent composers, um, composing for that one. Uh, there was one, uh, independent Japanese composer who, uh, was a former employee of Bandai Namco. Um, Arima is his last name. Um, and he was the lead composer on that. They trusted him from that relationship. And so he, he was, he put together a composition team. Uh, and I had worked at him when he was at Bandai Namco with, on uh, Mobile Suit Gundam game. And so oh, wow. he knew me from that. And so he brought me in on that project. But that was all independent composers. What um, kind yeah, of game I, would you want to make? Yeah. So if, if I were to make a game, first of all, I, uh, I would love to have like 
48 more hours a day to study coding or something and, <laughs> and have that skill set, but there's just not enough time in the day to do that and practice all my instruments. Um, so, but in, in the, in the fanciful world where I know how to program and I can make my own game, um, I would definitely do a story-based game, like an RPG. Those are the ones I love playing. Um, me too. Yeah. Those, and you know, I hardly have time to sit down and play like a 120 hour game anymore. Uh, but gotta avoid Xenoblade Chronicles then. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's on the two playlist. Uh, oh, it's a great game, but it is very long. No, I love those games. I love doing, but also the completionist syndrome kind of takes over, you know, uh, like why do I need to collect that last stone? It doesn't get me <laughs> anything. I've already beaten the game. I just need it. Okay. I just need a hundred percent everything. Yeah. So 15 more hours down the tubes, you know, uh, no, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you know what? Kids of Care Now is a nice zippy game. It's Kids, fast paced. Uh, you know, it, it is right now, but I'm just thinking like there's about in the current build, I think there will probably be about three hours of gameplay, but we're adding all the side quest stuff in now. So that's going to balloon really quickly uh, as mm -hmm. we continue to build that stuff out. So it won't be as fast as we think it is. I'm actually thinking that game's going to be a lot longer than what we initially planned it to be. Yeah, no, well, well, that's good. I like I, I like how in the beginning you're in prison and then you have to break out, so that's nice and snappy, right? But yeah, I'm not sure there's moments in the game where it slows down too. Actually, I have a question for you on that note because we were talking uh, before we went live about uh, that you were telling me a little bit about your game, but you said you were making a JRPG. Yes. And is that? I mean, obviously that's a style, but it doesn't oh. seem a little bit odd. Make, being in America and making, making a, a Japanese role yeah. playing game. Well, I think there's a lot of that? indies out there who actually who are US based that make JRPGs. Because if you mm. look at like the difference between your Western RPGs and the JRPGs, the JRPGs are ones that are more on rails and more kind of like based off of a set of characters versus you're you're sort of creating the character and you're not on rails and you're exploring the world and sort of experiencing the story how you want to instead of how the developers want to experience it. I like JRPGs. I grew up on them. I don't mind Western RPGs, but I, uh, I think you get more character development and story. Like I'm experiencing someone else's story for sure. I'm right. not experiencing the way I want to experience it. And I think I actually prefer experiencing someone else's uh, artwork yeah uh, I'm, the, I'm the same way in that regard uh experiencing it in the third person rather than in the first person yes um and i also i'm just thinking about the reverse of that uh i guess no one calls dark souls like a jrpg even though it's made in japan right a souls like game like that's oh, it's become its a genre thing. unto okay. itself now which is i've never played dark i've never, never played any of the souls games neither have i they seem really uh hard <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure they're great but i'm not really in it to try to overcome something i'm in, I'm in it for the story i'm avoiding metroid dread because i've heard it's really hard and i was really wanting to actually play a metroid game but it's like no i'm gonna get pissed off at it so i'm not gonna buy it <laughs> yeah oh man we're so we're so weak there, there's some <laughs> hardcore gamers listening right now who are just def definitely like eating their breakfast like cursing at us maybe if i were like a teenager again or a little kid where i had the patience, yeah, the patience I, I, I don't even know if i had the patience to the time yeah mm. no man if you were a teenager what? again blair you'd probably put more time into Cameron Devon. well i put a lot of time when we were kids working on the same game <laughs> mm. You know, one thing I will not do, though, is for my first playthrough of a game, which is the only playthrough these days, but for my first playthrough of a game, I will not look up online what I'm supposed to do. I do. If yeah. I get stuck or I'm not sure, it's like, I don't want to waste time figuring it it's, out. I just It's up. a hard urge to break, right? But then at a certain point, for me, that's kind of the line where I'm not experiencing it anymore, you know? It's not like yeah. I'm not, I'm not feeling like I don't need the sense of accomplishment necessarily, but it, it's like, am I playing a game or am I, why don't I just watch this on YouTube now? That's fair. Uh, the only thing is I got stuck so many times in games as kids because I didn't know what to do next. Mm. And I'm pretty sure well, that was what... a common experience for a lot of people back in the day, pre-internet, pre like, um, well, you can do call the 1-800 or 1-900 numbers or whatever <laughs> and ask for help, but no one, my parents would let me do that. Well, that's <laughs> why you have Nintendo power. You can, are you kidding? That's why I still have like 
36 issues of that sitting in my attic. That's a Sega nice. fanboy. There wasn't the same thing for Sega back then. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Me and Blair used to be Nintendo versus Sega rivals back in the day, too. Oh, man. Rivals all around. Dumb, dumb kids. I'm stuff. sure one of you was, was Pokemon Red, one, one was Blue. I never really played Pokemon. Oh, okay. <laughs> Neither did I. You'd like it. I, I, I probably would. <laughs> yeah, if you like yeah. linear, linear JRPGs. Yeah, but I, I guess the animal collecting or monster collecting RPG never really sparked my interest. I didn't I didn't find it. In, yeah, I just never really got into it. Hmm. Yeah, well, again, to each his own. Exactly. All right, so Zach, uh, what's keeping you busy these days? Well, I just uh, just last week we recorded a new EP. Um, so what's like, an EP? Uh, electronic press i believe is what it uh stands for um it's just a it's a smaller uh album basically it's you're not you're not putting out physical releases which used to be it, it, not a given uh when eps were first coming out <laughs> but um so yeah three or four tracks um so i just went into the studio with uh with my quartet jazz quartet and for this one also had a string quartet plus a uh a really special soloist named Jeremy Kittle, um, violin soloist, uh, joined for, for one song. So there are two tunes that I wrote um, in the last couple of years, and one that um, I wrote in college that I've just never gotten a good uh, recording of that I still like. Um, so I have, still have to do a bunch of editing on that, so that's, that's keeping me busy uh, for sure, editing and mixing. And then, you know, there are some game projects as well. Um, and I have a couple uh, Shakuhachi performances coming up sort of in the contemporary classical space. Any um, game projects you can actually talk about or all under all I can never NBA. talk about anything I'm working, at, uh, working on it. right now. Nah, Darn. But, <laughs> yeah, there should be, I mean, they're, they always get, the deadlines always get pushed also. So I'd like to say like, it should be an exciting one coming this December, <laughs> but I don't know. It'll probably get pushed until next summer. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you'll, <laughs> I'll certainly be posting about it on Instagram when I do uh, when I do finally get these things out because there was a lot you know the, the video game industry did not slow down over the pandemic that's for sure. I'd say it sped up. Yeah, it was kind of built for social more. distancing. distancing so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wasn't too too affected. So when your EPs are ready, let let us know. We'll definitely promote them on Twitter, uh, Instagram, etc. Um, sure. Yeah. And if you know right. when they are, feel free to say it right now if you actually know but man i have no idea i'm if, if it'd be a miracle to get it done editing uh before the end of the year but um probably probably release sometimes now. well it has to release sometime next year right. we're gonna pivot here we're gonna talk you already mentioned it a little bit uh the Apit big band oh yeah I saw them back in 2019 in Boston before COVID and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. let's start with what is the 8-Bit Big Band? So the 8-Bit Big Band is, um, that's Charlie Rosen's project. Charlie Rosen is not human. He's an android <laughs> sent from some other planet uh, uh, where everybody is extremely musically talented and plays every single instrument. And uh, he decided with that talent that he was going to, he's also a huge video game nerd. Um, and grew up playing the same kind of kind of uh, games I did, uh, and especially a lot of classic Nintendo games. Um, so he put together this big band where he arranges all of this, all of the music um, with his very special and uh, deft touch. Um, and he's just using a bunch of really slamming New York musicians, like the the best jazz musicians in New York City. So it's. Um, it's probably the best big band I've ever played in, like video game music or not. And it's super tight. The arrangements are super awesome. Charlie's a great band leader, and it's just one of the most fun bands to play in and 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 play for play play live shows with. How did you get involved with it? Uh, Charlie, uh, how did he call me in the first place? So Charlie, I actually met Charlie at Berkeley uh, in two thousand. 10 i want to say um he was uh, my roommate um asked me to sub for him on a, on a project that uh charlie was putting together <laughs> at college and i had gotten the dates mixed up um 
yeah, I thought it was, uh, so I did the rehearsal and then I couldn't do the recording. And I, I, I thought at that point, okay, well, I'll never work with him again. I just showed myself to be unreliable. And then flash forward, like I think 2017 is when he started the band, uh, 2017 or 2018. Um, but he had just gone to Japan right before he, um, right before he started the band. And I just saw randomly on Facebook that he was looking for a shamisen and a shamisen teacher. And I had just come back from Japan. Uh, he wanted to pick one up while he was there. Shamisen is a, uh, it's kind of like a Japanese banjo, um, like huh. three stringed, has a big old, not a pick, but a plectrum. It's this humongous thing that they slap the instrument with. Um, and you've definitely heard the sounds uh, in some of these, in some JRPGs, wherever there's classic Japanese music. Um, but so I hooked him up with a shamisen teacher there and that's how we reconnected. And then he just called me randomly saying, Hey, you want to come play some video game music? And I said, do, do, do I want to come play some video game music? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to. Awesome. I loved, I really loved that performance. I love the show. It was a lot of fun. I apologize. I did not stick around to, um, to talk to you after I, I always been to sort of talk to you after that and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, et cetera. But uh, I was, we were supposed to have a lot more shows after that. So you were going to yeah, have a lot more opportunities. COVID would have, uh, yeah, COVID yeah. kind of took care of that, but I had to go home. Like I had to hop on a train like 6am the next day. And I was like, Oof. I just got to go to bed. So yeah. Yeah. My I'll biggest, uh, my biggest request for the 8-bit big band is more Sonic music and more Sega Genesis JRPG music, like fantasy star four. If, if you can convince them to do that, that would be so awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll like front row center. <laughs> yeah. I'll put a word in. He's always looking for recommendations for music because, you know, we've done, I think, the entire Super Mario catalog at this point. <laughs> like, he's, he's done a whole lot of Mario music. So, um, I know he's done, a, like, one or two from Sonic. Um, yeah, but, yeah, I think yeah, he did a, a in there. Spring Yard and one other. I, I've actually listened to them recently, so... but. I, it's escaping my mind right now, but whatever. Yeah, there's one that that he always mispronounces at shows. Oh yes, Hydrocity versus yeah, Hydro that's the City. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He I always, pronounce he the Hydro always, City. Everybody always gets mad at him no matter what, how he pronounces it. <laughs> he pronounces it. I'm a Hydro City guy, not a Hydrocity guy. Okay, yeah. And for I those would... of you who don't know, what we're talking about we're talking about Sonic the Hedgehog three. It's a, the water zone in that one. It's either Hydro City or Hydrocity zone. I, 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 I mean, it's got to be Hydro City. Come on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you're with me now. <laughs> Let's look at it. What did they think? <laughs> so now that COVID's kind of, you know, letting up a little bit, are there any uh, yeah, new don't shows? Don't say it too loud. Out? Okay. Oh, yeah. Knock on wood. Are, are there any new shows planned right now, or is it still kind of paused? For 8-Bit Big Band? Yeah. Um, well, Charlie's been in London for the last six months um, oh. working on a movie. I'm not sure how much I can say about his movie, but he's been like working on a movie. He's at like Abbey Road Studios all day. He's living the dream. That's um, pretty cool. But uh, so I'm not sure when the next live show is going to be, but he's Charlie, so he never sleeps. And like I said, he's an alien. So if he does, he's, he's just kind of composing or arranging in his, in his sleep. Uh, but he, uh, he has been arranging more music for the next album. So it's, it's not like we've been stagnant um, or not like he's been stagnant. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. Um, I would expect exciting. early next year. I'm, I'm not too sure on the details. That's great. Yeah. I'm sure when he's back though, he's going to want to uh, put another, get another show together. Have you guys ever performed in New York City or is it kind of too expensive to get a hall and all that stuff here? No, we've performed twice. We did one at, or no, we performed three times three times in new york city uh one of them was um ah oh god i'm forgetting the name of the place there's this underground um venue or it was our first show ever this underground venue uh in like the soho area um and that was it was sort of a smaller room and it was so sold out so it was oh, wow. such a fire hazard all the people we had in there <laughs> Uh, and it was also super loud because the ceilings are really low and we didn't have risers for the trumpets. So they're just like right into the back of your heads, you know. Um, but it was super, super fun, um, really high energy. And the next one we did was at Sony Hall, um, which is in Midtown. Uh, but even Sony Hall fitting like a full big band plus string section 
is uh, is hard to fit on a stage and hard to find a board. Not like the one that's definitely right behind me with a million <laughs> inputs, uh, but it's hard to find uh, find a place that can handle all that. I had to play a shakuhachi solo where I couldn't hear myself, like over a big band. Uh, oh wow! We were doing something from Goemon. Uh, Goemon's Great Adventure was his, his obscure N sixty four game. Um, but there's a shakuhachi solo he wrote on that. And I was just like praying that I was making a sound cause I couldn't hear anything I was playing. Uh, cause they didn't get my monitor like happening <laughs> before with the show. They had so many other lines to check. Um, obviously yeah. it worked out though. <laughs> as far people, as you know, <laughs> people screamed either in horror or in approval. I'm not sure which one still trying or to, or they couldn't out. hear over their own screaming and it all just worked out anyway. Yeah. Maybe they're just like, Hey, that guy's standing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that you know, it's fun the uh, to play the video game music for for these audiences because especially uh, like the JRPGs and stuff. Like people will sit there and they'll 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 have a relationship with this music because they've listened to it on loop for tens of hours at a time. Guilty. Yeah, uh, like while playing the game, and so it really means something to them. And so the most passionate audiences I've ever played for are video game audiences I, I had the chance to play with Nobuo Uematsu uh, years ago with an orchestra um, while I was in Boston at PAX East um, and it was the first PAX East I think because again fire hazard they didn't like think about capacity we had like 7,500 people in oh, wow. this like big hollowed out um, convention hall and Nobuo Uematsu was there. They had cameras on him. And you knew every, we were playing One Winged Angel. And every time he came on screen, it, you couldn't hear anything. It was just a wall of screaming. And you see people crying in the audience. He means so much to people, myself included. You know, One Winged Angel is a pretty, pardon my language, but fucking awesome song. I was actually listening to it this morning. So yeah, uh, there's an orchestra that I watch on YouTube out of, out of Paris that that plays that and the Genova music from Final Fantasy Rolls from Final Fantasy 7 and it's uh yeah the uh, yeah it, it gets the it pulls the heartstrings yeah definitely <laughs> I would say like my dream would be to play um the Zeromis um song with Nubu that's the one uh the, it's which the final one? boss music for Final Fantasy 2 oh wow you're going way back yeah was that Japanese too or American too? That's American too. So Japanese, I think it would be four. Okay. Blair, you must have played that game when you were Yeah, I did. Play. I don't remember the music though. Oh, you got to uh, listen to it, man. Yeah, it's I'll a, go back and listen to that one. sick track. Well, I have it on my Nintendo uh, DS. That's the first time I actually owned it. And it was the 3D remake, so it was a little different. You know, I had an interesting relationship with with his music. He was one of the huge, obviously, Final Fantasy X, and then I went on a whole Final Fantasy um, binge after that. Uh, all through high school, I was just going back, playing the old games, because um, ten was the newest one at that point. Um, and I, I, I would, I had found the music uh, of these old games, like the piano collections and the orchestral collections, before I played the games. And it was a sort of an interesting experience, like the reverse, because when usually you play the game and then you get to hear like, oh, this is what he was actually hearing. And that was just as close as he could get. But to kind of have what he was actually hearing as the original version, going back to the original, uh, uh, the original in my mind, going back and playing like Final Fantasy two or six, um, it, it didn't have the same like I didn't have the same connection to the music, the, the original recordings. Uh, as I think most people did who played the games first. But I still had a, a big connection to the music because it was just beautiful music on its own. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, glad to, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm glad they do so many rearranges and, and concerts of this kind of music because it's brought it to a wider audience for sure. I know it. Like, yeah, it actually doesn't matter how many covers of his music that i that i listen to i enjoy them all because they're all going to be a little bit different yeah because it's like each musician's own kind of inspiration or, or take on it hmm. was, was Always. It one of the sorry go ahead gary oh go ahead was it one of the inspirations for 8-bit 
8-bit big band to get a younger audience going or maybe maybe our yeah. age of audience going so back to concert halls to listen to music again yeah that's kind of charlie's concept for the whole thing when you look at uh the J the american songbook which is jazz standards the this the music that we learn to to learn jazz and uh the music you hear in in jazz clubs all the time um that's a songbook that was built on the popular music of the time um which is uh, at that time, it was all about music theater. Um, so a lot of the pop music theater things in the 40s, Broadway show tunes, musicians would take and do covers of. And that's how you get, uh, you know, Miles Davis playing Surrey with a fringe on top. Or George and Ira Gershwin having like a million tunes that are uh, that are in the book. So Charlie looks at it the same way. He says, this is music of an era. Uh, popular music of an era and we're going to do our take on it and um, yeah uh, w a side effect of that is certainly I'm not sure how much it was intended maybe it was but I think Charlie's intention was mostly he loves this music and he wants to arrange it and have a big band play it but uh, a side effect that of that is certainly and sort of a mission that has grown out of it now that he's been doing it seems to be uh, young people uh, are listening to jazz and maybe this is their first introduction to jazz just because they had a relationship with a video game tune and that's great hopefully they go off and they they explore more more jazz that's not necessarily video game music or if this is just where they enjoy it that's fine too but you know jazz needs all the vitality it can inject it into it uh these days yeah i go ahead gary no i was just gonna go on to the next question all right but unless you had something to add there. No, I'm good. All right. Uh, so yeah, back to uh, back to Zach. Uh, so tell us what you find the most interesting about like all the different mediums that you create music for. Like you've done video games, live shows, um, albums, and also film. Um, how have those different experiences made you grow as a musician? Hmm. Um, I'd say. You know, it's, I view each project, there's, there's your own creative work and there's client work. Um, and both can be fulfilling, but you have to approach each very differently. You know, when I'm writing for myself, it's the goal is to come up with something brand new that's, that nobody else has done before, or express something that I'm feeling, or to really explore. Um, and so the satisfaction comes from coming up with something really new and cool and like nobody's done this before. But if I try to take that concept to client work, whether it's video games or film or commercials or anything, um, they would say, they might say that sounds cool, but that's not the purpose of this. It's to, uh, the purpose here is to craft the emotions underneath our scene um, or underneath whatever it is that we're scoring here. Um, so I've, I've learned to kind of put my, when I first started, I, I, when they, when they would tell me it sounds too jazzy, I would take that as an insult. I'd be like, how dare you insult my baby? You know? Uh, and that's an instinct that's really hard to suppress for any creative person. When you worked really hard on a thing and you're like, yeah, that's it and you turn it in expecting them to be on the same page. And then they're like, it's all right, but it's not really what we were thinking of. Uh, can you make it more like cowboy bebop? <laughs> uh, like it, you, you, the, the instinct is to sigh and go, yeah, we can make it more like cowboy bebop or you can, or get mad and say, no, we can't make it like, that's what Stravinsky did when he, uh, they had him score a couple movies or try to score one movie. And within like the first couple cues, the director said, yeah, but could we make this change? And he said, uh, no, <laughs> I am Stravinsky. No. And so he wasn't a very good film composer, uh, cause he was writing for him, not for the client. So I've learned to kind of put that ego in check and just say, not take things personally when I get that feedback. It's just like, okay, it's not what you're looking for. Let's, uh, my goal is to get you what you're looking for. And if I can sneak in a cool jazzy chord here and there, I'll do it. But usually it's my favorite part that they, they highlight and say, oh, we like everything except for that. 
right there. Like, ah, yeah, ah, got him again. Um, but then that's okay. I'll just take that out and put it in a folder and I'll use it on something else of my own sometime. <laughs> you feel the same way when I do that to you, Gary? What's that? No, I just, uh, I just tell you to go fuck yourself. No. <laughs> See, working in the indie space, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would only do that to Blair just because he's my friend and he'd probably tell me the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, and I and I, and I do. <laughs> Sounds like see, a healthy. See, Zach, all the fun is in the indie space. Yeah, you gotta, like you gotta a come working here. Working relationship you guys have. I can't even. I, uh, even when Blair is right, I'll tell him to go back. <laughs> I, I definitely can't say fuck you when I get a uh, when when Capcom tells me to make a re revision. That would be problematic. Come to the indie space. Come come work with us at Gumbo. It's a lot of fun. I don't know if you've heard of Gumbo. We talk about it all the time with the pod on the podcast though. Uh, I've never although, heard of it. No. Uh, well, it's, um, it, it's a group of all, a bunch of game developers and there's a few musicians involved as well. Uh, they have a shared working space in Brooklyn in Dumbo. And I go there a couple times a week uh, to just, well, I work from there on Fridays for my day job and then I do some game stuff and I go one day on the weekend as well. It's a, you'll see a lot of people you met at Playcrafting. It's very much a lot of the same people. Hmm. It's, a, it's a lot of fun. But That's cool. I mean, if you're if you want to get uh, involved in an indie project, you might need to lower your rates a tad because I don't, I might not be able to forge you otherwise. You don't know my rates. What's up? You don't know my rates. I do not know your rates. I'm just assuming. <laughs> for all you know, I'm working for free. That's why I have all these credits. Uh, probably. I'm going to guess it's probably not true, but okay. Yeah. Have <laughs> Maybe you seen some this studio are. behind me? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it must cost you a lot to download that JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. I couldn't think of a witty comment there. You got, you got it. All right, Zach. What advice would you give to other aspiring musicians, artists, or creators? Oh, man. Um, well, I guess to make it broad, do um, you, you mean people trying to get into games? Okay, yeah. Let's, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get into games. games. Yeah, I can. I got plenty of advice for all those whippersnappers out there, just in life in general. But uh, getting into getting into games, or yeah, any any industry that you want to get into, really. Um, I mean, what I was just talking about. First of all, like check your ego at the, ego at the door. Um, that's never going to help you. Uh, just be really easy to work with. It actually reminds me. There's a there's a. a jazz guitarist in the city told me this uh this mantra that i kind of go by now and it's um to to be a musician all you got to do is show up on time be a good time and have good time if you can do all three of those things you're golden so show up on time don't be late because it doesn't matter how good you are if you uh if you if you're not on time uh, be a good time. Nobody wants to work with somebody who's difficult to work with, who's who's causing problems or is just a jerk. And then have good time. Basically, be a good musician. Have good uh, good tempo, like control of your of your of your tempo and so on. So that can be uh, in in any job, really, um, especially in creative jobs where you're working on a team. Um, that's uh, having that mentality is key. Um, aside from that, just um, finding that first gig is really difficult. Um, and you can almost feel get, uh, a little desperate um, when you don't have any gigs. I certainly went through it. When I moved from Boston to New York, I was going back to Boston every weekend to play wedding gigs, um, taking the mega bus of all things. It's a wonder that I'm still here and and I, I'm not like infected with some kind of disease that was previously oh, unknown to man i've taken the mega bus before it's not that bad okay man. oh man i've taken so many <laughs> once i discovered bolt bus it was uh it was it was life-changing but um that's what just what i had to do to make ends meet to make before i made the connections that i needed in new york to start working more regularly and i could stop taking a four-hour trip up four-hour trip back on a horrible bus um sorry I, mega bus isn't isn't sponsoring this today is it no, we don't <laughs> okay, have good. Any sponsors. Good, and they never will. Uh, <laughs> but um, you just cost as a sponsor, man. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you got to believe in what you're trying to do and do anything that you have to to make that happen. Uh, and that might mean taking a gig outside of music or whatever it is you're trying to do. It might mean trying taking doing things like going 
to Boston every weekend to make it happen. Um, but the important thing is that you keep on going because your first connection might not have anything for you right now, but two years from then they might, if you, if they remember you, they might hire you for that thing. And then if you do a good job, they'll tell all they'll for their friends that you did a good job. And then the next time they're looking for a composer, uh, one of those friends might call you and it's sort of, it's like this tree that just spreads out. Uh, and eventually you have enough connections that you have consistent work and then you're kind of golden, but none of that happens if your skills aren't up to par, if you're alienating people cause you're not fun to work with, or if you don't get things done or don't show up on time. So with that base layer, you just have to have patience and stick with it. And eventually luck will find you, but you have to be ready when that luck arrives. That is wonderful advice. <laughs> That's great. We are going to close out with an easy one. Well, actually, I am going to give you a chance to promote anything you want to promote after this, but we are going to close out with, it with an easy one. I'm putting the uh, bunny ears on that. Uh, you've been around the New York gaming game development scene for a while. Maybe COVID kind of put a damper on that for everyone. But what I was, there, been... I was there at the start of Playcrafting. You were, yeah, you've been around for forever. Yeah. What's been your favorite New York-based indie game? Uh, that would have to be, I'm glad you let me, uh, let me look at this beforehand because I'd be like thinking, right. Oh, there's that one. There's that one. There's that one. But that would have to be Lamplight City, uh, by Crudestat oh, wow. Games. Did you play yes. that one? Yes. I love Lamplight City. I have yeah. to, I gotta, I gotta have him on the podcast when we oh, do yeah. our He'd season two. It. Yeah. Francisco. Francisco yeah, Gonzalez. Francisco. Yeah. He's, he's always coming to the, um, to the audio hangs in New York also. Oh, really? Does uh, he do music? No, he doesn't. Uh, I mean, he knows a thing or two about audio, but Mark Bennis did the music for that one. Um, but yeah, music is tremendous. The The writing is fantastic. I was so, I mean, I knew he was a good designer and good artist, but I mean, you can't believe that this is just one guy who did all of it. Uh, and then the music and voice acting was done by, that, that's the only things he outsourced because he doesn't have a thousand different voices. Uh, but yeah, it's an incredible game. That point is a point and click adventure. Um, really, really nice art. Like that old, uh, you think like monkey islands style. Yeah. It's um, like King's quest, like the later ones. Yeah. And like, no, I mean, branching, ones. there are all these different paths too. I definitely, it's not easy either. It's like a, it's a, it's a mystery game. Um, and you have to, you have to figure out like multiple chapters of what's going on in there. And I was engrossed the entire game. It was great. I, I loved it. Yeah, the, he's got talent in that. That's a great game. And I remember asking him questions about how he did a lot of the like the art with respect to the movement and, and the animations. And he told me he took pictures of himself in every pose he wanted the characters in the game to be. And then he just drew over it. And it's like, that oh, sounds man. painstaking, but also awesome. Yeah, he's a super creative guy. I wouldn't be surprised yeah, he if he like just came up with that idea himself like to to do that, to make the art happen. Yeah, he is. All right. Uh, anything you want to promote before we close out here? Um, uh, if this does go out uh, the day that, it, uh, like, what, November 7th? Is November it? 7th was uh, the first part, probably also second, probably November 14th. Okay. Uh, well, November 14th, I am uh, playing with a Shakuhachi Quintet uh, at Tenry Cultural Institute at 4 p.m. Um, that's down near, uh, like, a... Uh, NYU new school kind of area. We'll put all this in the uh, description yeah. as well. So um, people... But yeah, it's a American premiere of a new composition for five shakuhachis, which is pretty much all the shakuhachi players in New York City. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great gathering. I'm going to be able to play some um, traditional Japanese music with my uh, the, the guy who's taught me everything I know about the shakuhachi. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. And anything else like that EP release, uh, it's... Uh, it all goes up on my Instagram, just at Zach Zinger. Great. We'll have all your uh, social information in the uh, description as well for both YouTube version and the other podcast versions. Anyway, Zach, thank you for taking the time to do this. It's been a great pleasure having you on, on the podcast. And uh, we got to get together again some point in the future here. And maybe we'll see at a play crafting event or grab a drink sometime or something. Definitely. But yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Always a pleasure to talk about game music. Thanks. It's been great having you. Thank you, Zach. All right. Thanks, Gary.